Good evening and welcome to the July 17th meeting of the Glendale City Council. May we have the roll call, please. Council members Agajanian. Present. Devine. Here. Garpedian. Najarian. Here. Mayor Sananian. Here. Today's flag salute will be led by Council Member Najarian. After the salute, please remain standing for the invocation. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing for the invocation, which will be delivered this evening by Reverend Todd Leonard, senior pastor at Glendale City Church. Let us pray. Sovereign of the universe, mercifully receive our prayer for our land and its government and our city and its government. Let your blessing pour out on all who live in and serve here. Instruct us in your ways. Enable us to understand your principles of justice so that peace and tranquility, happiness and freedom might never turn away from our land. Please, wise one, God of the life breath of all flesh, waken your spirit within all of us and plant among the peoples of different nationalities and faiths who dwell here love and brotherhood, peace and friendship. Uproot from our hearts all hatred and en enmity, all jealousy and vying for supremacy. Fulfill the yearning of all people of our country to speak proudly in its honor. Fulfill our desire to see it become a light to all nations. May it be your will that our land should be a blessing to all inhabitants of the globe, cause to dwell among all peoples friendship and freedom, and soon fulfill the vision of your prophet. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation. Let them learn no longer ways of war. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Leonard. May we have the report, Mr. Clerk. Mr. Mayor and Council, the agenda for the July 17, 2018 regular meeting of the Glendale City Council was posted on Friday, uh, July 13, 2018 on the bulletin board outside City Hall. Thank you. Next item, please. Next item is agenda previews for the meetings of Tuesday, July 24, 2018. Mr. Bologna. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of City Council. Uh, on July 24, 2018, Housing Authority uh, commencing at 3 p.m. There are no agendized items. Um, for the City Council and Housing Authority joint meeting starting at 3 p.m., there's an item from Director of Community Development regarding update on housing legislative platform related to affordable housing strategy. In the evening, commencing at 6 p.m. for the City Council, there are a number of consent items, starting with chief, a report from Chief of Police to authorize the purchasing administrator to issue a purchase order, service authorization for police dispatch workstations. Fire Chief, regarding donations from La Crescenta, Kiwanis, insurance brokers and agents of Burbank, Glendale, Pasadena, and the Glendale Firefighters Association for the Junior Fire Marshal Program. Another item from Fire Chief and Chief of Police regarding acceptance of funding from the United States Department of Homeland Security 2017 Urban Area Security Initiative UASI Grant Program in the amount of $55,604. An item from Public Works regarding approval of the final map of track number 74370 for a six unit condominium subdivision at 532 to 536 West Elk Avenue. And the last one from Director of Community Development, authorizing the city manager to execute a professional services agreement for the purchase of anal purpose of analyzing current standards and recommending amendments to the downtown specific plan. Under action items, uh, item from city manager regarding designation of a voting delegate and alternates for the League of California Cities annual conference. Another item from city manager regarding adoptee citizenship rights report. Uh, from fire chief regarding payment for aircraft and firefighting services performed by the city of Los Angeles and the unified United States Department of Agriculture Forest Service in response to the September 1st, 2017 through September 10, 2017, Latuna Canyon fire. 
an item from Fire Chief regarding a proposed Fire Recruit Academy for fiscal year 2019 from Public Works regarding five-year purchase order contract with National Ready Mix Concrete to provide various grades of Ready Mix Concrete for maintenance and repair of cities concrete hardscape. Another item from Public Works regarding purchase of John Deere tractor loader for the Community Service and Parks Department and dispensing with competitive bidding. Uh, a report from Chief of Police regarding the, a gun buyback event. And lastly, Director of Community Service and Parks regarding design development and construction documents for Duke Medjian Park Nature Education Center Projects Phase 4, Part 3. Under hearings, uh, Fire Chief regarding weed abatement charges 2017-2018. That concludes my report, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Guaranya. Next item, please. Mr. Mayor and Council, before we move on to the next item, uh, which would be the consent items, there has been direction that uh, item 9B under hearings uh, will be moved to July 31st. Uh, and that, because it was a hearing and it was noticed as such, must be done by council action, a motion, a second, and a vote to move it to a date certain. Will you read so that the item the is. Will you read it into the yes, record? Yes, I will. The item is Director of Community Development regarding Armenian American Museum and Cultural Center of California. Motion uh, one is motion finding a project is exempt from California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA pursuant to Section 15332 of the state CEQA guidelines, urban and fill two is a motion approving standards variance permitting the loading uh, area to be uh, partially located off site and adopting findings in support thereof. Three is a motion approving stage two design review. Four is a resolution approving a summary report pursuant to California Government Code Section 52201 on the ground lease agreement by and between the city and the Armenian American Museum and Cultural Center for California for lease of certain city owned property located in Central Park. Five is introduction of ordinance approving a ground lease agreement by and between the city of Glendale and the Armenian American Museum and Cultural Center of California. Again, all of these items will be moved to date certain of July 31st uh, by your direction and vote. Do we have a motion to move the item to July 31st? I'll move that they be moved to July 31st. Second. May we have the roll call, please? Council members Agajanian? Yes. Devine? Yes. Garpedian? Najarian? Yes. Mayor Sinanian? Yes, thank you. Let's move on to the consent calendar. Mr. Mayor and Council, following a routine and may be acted upon by one motion, any member of Council or the audience requesting separate consideration may do so by making such request before motion is proposed. Thank you. Would my colleagues like to move any of the items uh, from the consent calendar? No, remove. I'd, no, remove, no. Oh, you'd I'd, like to move the, the balance? Sure. And I'd like to I'd like to pull actually four oh, e. Pull I'd like okay. to pull four e, four e, and then um, I'll move the, the remainder of the calendar. Second. May we have the roll call for the balance? Council members Agajanian. Yes. Devine. Yes. Garpedian. Najarian. Yes. Mayor Sinanian. Yes. Uh, item four e, please. Item four e is general manager of Glendale Water and Power regarding Inter Mountain. Power Project IPP Alternative Repowering in California Energy Commission CEC Emissions Performance Standards Compliance Filing. E1 is a motion authorizing General Manager of Glendale Water and Power to vote at the IPP Coordinating Committee in favor of an alternative repowering that would reduce the size of the IPP repowering from 1,200 megawatts to 840 megawatts and finding that such action is exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act. Two is a resolution approving the Emission Performance Standard Compliance filing for submittal to the California Energy Commission and authorizing the General Manager of Glendale Water and Power to submit such filing to the CEC and finding that such action is exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just, uh, I pulled this item because uh, it does have an impact on our uh, future access to renewables. And, this, and I know that our goal, the goal of the City Council and GWP is to increase our renewables as the uh, as in the future and uh, I'd like for you to give us a brief report on how this will impact that ability sure mr. mayor members of the council council member divine this is the intermountain power project which is located in Utah city of Glendale along with 34 other agencies in Utah and California have been a member 
of this uh, project since 1980. It's coming up for its expiration in 2027. This is an 1800 megawatt coal-fired plant that we access not only generation from, but more importantly, vitally important, is the transmission that we get from this. It's one of the only two places that we get transmission, and it's a package deal. We have to be in this project in order to get that transmission. Uh, post 2027, when this uh, agreement expires, California cities would not be able to take that power any longer because coal is uh, powered uh, or coal fired generation is not allowable in the state of California. Therefore, the project has been going under a review for repower. The original repowering scenario was 1,200 megawatts. As you can see from the report, that's been downgraded to 840 megawatts, which is the minimum requirement to keep the transmission system viable. So that's a good thing. You go from 1,800 megawatts of coal to 1,200 megawatts of gas to ultimately 840 megawatts of gas. It's moving in the right direction. Some people may not be exactly happy with that, but it's moving in the right direction. What that does, though, is that frees up the transmission even more so to bring renewables across to California and especially here to Glendale. That's an area that's pretty uh, accessible to both solar and wind. And there's also uh, development of a, a uh, compressed air generation project that LEDWP is undertaking in the general vicinity of the plant. So the project for us is, is imperative because of the transmission. But it's also nice that we're getting into a, a project that is continuing to look towards environmental quality and improving the environment and beginning to move away from fossil fuel, although albeit it's not something we can, we can cut loose right now. And we all know that from our discussions with Grayson but trying to find where we can generate the most in renewable energy and, and while we're reducing fossil fuel and remaining reliability or maintaining reliability um, and costs, keeping our cost impact to our ratepayers to a minimum. Thank you, thank you. I wanted all of the uh, conservationists and those that are uh, concerned about our, our moving towards more renewables to, to hear that information. So with that, I will move the item. Also, maybe you want to mention about the percentage of what we receive from this station or this place and in relation to Los Angeles. Sure. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, Councilmember Agajanian, the project, as I said, had 35 uh, participants. Six of those participants are California utilities, uh, LA, Burbank, Pasadena, Riverside, Anaheim, and Glendale. The six California cities make up 80% of the ownership of the facility. And of that 80%, LEDWP owns 60%. So they are the major driver in this. Um, it's a plant that they have a great interest in, not only just from the, what it generates and serves them, but they also actually are hands-on involved in the operation of that facility, the management oversight administration of the facility, I should say. It is a Utah-based corporation but very much relies on California cities for its existence. So LA on June 26, their commission unanimously passed this same uh, resolution or motion to, to uh, low, uh, reduce the uh, repower to 840 and to proceed with its construction. Thank you. We have a motion, do we have a second? Second. May we have a roll call please? Council members Agajanian. Yes. Devine? Yes. Carpetian? Yes. Majorian? Yes. Mayor Sinanian? Yes. Thank you. Uh, next item, City Council staff comments. Do we have comments, colleagues? Yes, uh, Mr. Majorian? Uh, I'd like to uh, place on the agenda for next meeting the uh, appointment of uh, Susan Rusalian to the uh, Commission on the Status of Women. Very well, thank you. That's been noted. Ms. Devine? Yes, fine. Uh, thank you. I, first of all, I wanted to um, uh, let everyone know that uh, Community Services and Parks Department received national recognition during the Community Parks and Recreation Society's annual awards program in March for our commitment to developing play and recreation space based on design and usage best practices by replacing playground equipment at Car Park and Nibley Parks that meet the Healthy Play Initiative standards. We are a national, these parks are national demonstration sites. They provide high quality, 
research-based best practices equipment for kids. Uh, they incorporate six key elements of play to promote physical activity and fitness. I went to a, uh, a, a, uh, an event that they had at Carr Park where they brought in kids from elementary schools and it was amazing. They had so much fun. They couldn't wait to get to the equipment. So for all the parents that are out there with kids, go to Nibley, go to um, a Carr Park, try out this equipment. It's absolutely fantastic. And they were all like little ninjas. Uh, going from uh, station to station. It's exceptional, and I want to congratulate our parks. And uh, to go right along with that, in Saturday's LA Times, I don't know how many of you saw this, but the Brand Park actually made the front page of um, the uh, Saturday section. And it's a beautiful article about the walking path, and the uh, headline is, You'll Feel Just Grand, and to walk into Glendale's history. So we should be really proud of this, and. Uh, congrats to uh, all of those in our uh, community services and parks department for that great recognition. Uh, secondly, let's see what was the second. We, um, the, all of us attended the, uh, uh, the independent uh, the cities uh, association uh, this past weekend and went to sessions on drones and homelessness and um, urban development and many other um, items. Uh, issues. It was in Carlsbad. It was uh, uh, very, uh, very well attended, and it was uh, very worthwhile. And finally, I want to uh, congratulate Mayor Sinanian because uh, yesterday he was elected president of the um, Hollywood Burbank Airport Authority. So I'm very proud uh, of Thank that. You. Thank you, Councilmember Devine, uh, Councilmember Hagajanian. Anything? Um, I just, I'm going to keep it short. I'll mention that last week, uh, our senator, uh, State Senator Portentino, had his formal office ribbon cutting, and we were there. I think most of us were there. And the reason I'm mentioning it is not only because we didn't mention last week, but I also see there's a card from his staff, and I guess they're going to come up and speak about something. So it's a good opportunity to thank the senator for his uh, wonderful um, political representation of his constituents in Sacramento, and also uh, thank him for choosing Glendale to be the location of his district office. It's very important, um, and um, I think it, it brings more attention to Glendale. It makes it easier for our residents to be in touch and contact with their state senator, and we look forward to him staying there for the duration of his tenure in the Senate. With that, I will move on to the next um, item, which is uh, the three-minute community events announcements, and I will invite John Jonathan Frink from Senator Portentino's office. And I see Arda's there, too. Arda Chakian is there from his office. And his interns are there, who were there at the ribbon cutting. Okay. Good evening, Mayor Sananian and council members. My name is Jonathan Frink. I'm an intern with the office of Senator Anthony Portentino. Joining me are my fellow interns, Kami, uh, Michelle, um, and Alik, and Senator Portentino's district representative, Arder Chakanian. Um, we are happy to be here this evening to observe the city council meeting as part of our internship and learn more about city government. Um, thank you for your time this evening. Thank you, welcome. Yeah. I hope you have a, a relatively pleasant <laughs> educational experience. <laughs> <laughs> um, but this is what we do. So one way or another, uh, sit back and enjoy the ride. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. And, and kudos to you for volunteering and interning at an elected official's office. I think it's a very important experience that you're gaining by doing so, and you'll appreciate it in the future to come. Yeah, thank you. And we're gonna move on to the three minute public comment uh, section. And we usually take, the rule is we take five, but I'm, I'm gonna make an exception because uh, one of the speakers has requested uh, an extra card. So we're gonna have six speakers. And we'll start with Susan O'Leary followed by Vanessa Royale. Good evening, Mr. Good evening. Mayor, City Council. Uh, 
Cannabis regulation is an economic opportunity. This is the beginning of a new industry in California and a nationwide trend. Nine states and the District of Columbia have legalized recreational cannabis. This year, six more states will put legalization on the vote. According to a recent survey by Pew Research Center, six in 10 Americans now favor legalization. Altogether, 40 states have passed laws that allow for medical use in some form. That covers 275 million Americans. Last month, Canada legalized recreational cannabis. Also last month, the FDA approved Epideliox, I'm not sure how to say that, a cannabis-based CBD drug for seizures. Last year, the National Institutes of Health awarded 140 million towards cannabis research. According to the National Survey of Drug Use and Health, cannabis sales, where they are illegal, topped 8 billion in 2017. Projections are for 24 billion in 2025. State revenues from taxes and permits totaled 745 million in 2017 and was used for budget shortfalls, schools, public health and law enforcement programs and are expected to reach 4.3 billion in 2020 and that's nationwide. So cannabis regulation is a potential economic opportunity for Glendale. Thank you. Thank you. We have Vanessa Royale followed by Megan Fialkoff. Welcome back. Thank you for having me back. We'll, we'll put it up right now. And you can control, you can advance it with the clicker. Thank you. This is the story of my neighbors and me at 1377 East Windsor fighting for rent control. In June, we received a notice that our rent will increase by 60%. Moss and Company says that they are heading in the direction that should enhance your tenant experience. This is not so. They are not enhancing our lives. They are limiting us to two options, move out or stay in a poorly run down apartment that has a very steep price. Moss and Company says that these issues were from the previous owner, but they are not striving to fix any of these. As you can see, we have cockroaches and termites. We have poor plumbing. We also have termite damage and water damage and mold. Faulty old appliances that barely work. In the next slide, you'll hear the voice of my neighbors from an NPR story. The hassle of construction has been any less than friendly or considerate. They have not been fixing any of the important problems. They are simply adding new paint and cement. This is just putting lipstick on a pig. As you can see, many of the neighbors have piles of rubble outside their doors. This is dangerous. There is dust flying everywhere, poor breathing conditions, and sometimes we are either locked out or locked into our apartments. City Council, I ask you, is this worth the rent spike? This apartment is an example of what was affordable to many low, come in, low income earners. But what happens when the affordable becomes unbearably expensive? Please consider rent control for your people. They should not have to suffer like this and pay far too much for far too little. As I said before, housing should always be a right and not a privilege, and there should always be 
people before greed. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, your as far as code enforcement is concerned, are are, are we aware of this? Have we yes, gone sir. out? Have we checked out? Because it looked pretty dramatic. Yes, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, based on the communication that was received last week, building and safety staff did visit the site, and based on what they saw, a stop work order was issued mm -hmm. last week. Uh, there's a meeting scheduled with the management company tomorrow, mm -hmm. um, and more information will be forthcoming after that meeting. Um, and we will keep the council apprised of what is happening at the site. How about uh, issues of habitability? Because it looks like there are bugs and cockroaches and they're, they're just not maybe, maybe unsanitary conditions. for. Sure, based on some of the um, items that had come forward, um, there were uh, our ability to be able to inspect some of the um, apartment facilities. Um, we were able to do so, I believe, um, in three of the facilities. Um, one of them um, is more of a tenant issue regard regarding mold. The other two issues um, were following up on the complaints with the management company. Okay, so this is at the center of our attention. Correct. Very well. Uh, That's what, uh, you yeah. already asked the question. Okay. okay. And just uh, as a general comment, this council is not interested in any rent hikes. We don't want them. We don't like them. We have no control over them. This is a market economy right now, and the landlord set these prices uh, according to the market. Well, that's their claim, that they set it according to the market. So we don't take any pleasure, actually we take a lot of displeasure in what's happening in the city and in the rental market. So with that in mind, I would like to invite Megan Fialkov, followed by Kathy Marfopoulos. Hello, good evening, Mayor mm -hmm. and members of the council. Uh, my name is Megan, and I just bought a house here in Glendale, uh, right up the mountain, and uh, with my husband, who's here tonight. And um, I'm here actually um, in regards to the issue of um, allowing to have pot shops in Glendale. Um, I bought a house here um, because it is not allowed, and which makes it a great place to have a family, a great place where it's safe, a great place to walk around, a great place to go shopping. And that is something that I think is a hallmark of this city. Um, we live in Westwood right now, and having pot shops in Westwood, what it actually means is weed maps, med men, uh, the weed that gets delivered to your door, the 420 weed limo parties, pot reeking in the air, which affects people that smoke pot or don't smoke pot, uh, strange images on the buildings that children see and is to me disturbing for anybody to see. And it's totally transformed the area and it's, it, it's just transformed the area. And I'm originally actually from Manhattan and I lived in Manhattan for eight years and I'm sure most of you know that in the 90s, Giuliani cleaned up the Times Square area that used to be filled with sex shops, uh, pornography, various things like that. And when he cleaned it up at that time, it brought in hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue to Times Square. Bloomberg came in, there's pedestrian sidewalks that were built, lots of tourism came in, and actually it was the opposite of perhaps what somebody might say about having pot shops legalized in a city. It's, it's not the same exact thing, but it is a similar type of thing. And so I've seen a city transform when that was cleaned up. I also studied abroad in Australia, and when I studied in Australia, there's a city where recreational marijuana is legal, and that city turned into a city, honestly, of a culture that really isn't designed or set up for a place to have family. And I think it's interesting, we start this meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance, we start this meeting with a prayer, and those are commitments to this country and our pride as a country and tradition and various things, and a future where children can grow up in a safe place. And I think that it's, it is something, regardless of what anyone else would say, it is a, a 
pride point and a dignity point also in addition to money in looking at this issue. The last thing I wanna leave you off with is something in regards to prediction and consequences in regards to prediction. In Oregon, they've already now decriminalized heroin and cocaine, and California is putting on the ballot to decriminalize mushrooms, and where does it end? So in making this decision, please take a look at the future and where this is actually going and how far it will actually go. Thank you. So thank you very much. Thank you. Kathy Marfopoulos, followed by Haik Mahmurian. Hello, Councilman. Um, actually, he's going to be speaking on my half, and I'm going to stand with him. That's OK. Thank you, Mayor and members of the Council. So my wife actually spoke, and uh, I wanted to reiterate that. I've been working in Glendale for over 10 years. I uh, work for a multi-million dollar company that's been located in Glendale for over 20 years. We fly clients from all over the United States and Canada to Glendale. Sorry, would you state your name? My name is Eamon Ranema. Make record of that, thank you. Because the card is on, on, on your name. Okay. No, it's okay. Is that okay? Just for the record, go ahead. I mean, no she's problem. yielding her time to you, so go ahead. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so basically, it's very important for us to basically keep the business here and people come up from all over the can you know, Canada and US. And as my wife said, we just bought a house here because this is an area that we want to raise families. Um, I've lived in New York before. I currently live in Westwood and Santa Monica. If you don't believe me, you should just go around and look around. Uh, you know, opening up pot shops, it not only diminishes the, uh, the, the area and actually brings a lot of homeless people. So you don't want that uh, in, in, in our city. So it, it is, imp like it's very interesting, like they bring up the, the fact that if you open up shops, it, it actually brings a lot of income to the city. It's, it's totally not true because people are gonna leave. So, it, and it's sad that we have to actually look at profit and rather than doing what is actually right for people. And I'm sure you don't want your kids and grandkids to uh, do drugs. I don't want my children to do drugs. I've never done drugs. My parents never allowed me to do drugs. So I like to live in an environment that's drug free. And uh, I hope I have your agreement and uh, Hopefully you guys would back me up on that so we would have an environment that's uh, clean, homeless free, and uh, so our businesses can flourish and prosper. And thank you so much for everything you have done. In the last 10 years I've worked here, it's been fantastic, and I want to acknowledge each and every one of you, and uh, thank you. Thank you. Hi, folks, please. Hi, Mahmurian, followed by Mike Mohel. Good evening. Uh, Good evening. Uh, and uh, I just want to say also that uh, I will translate the main points uh, into Armenian during my statement, as we have lots of Armenian speakers in the audience. In Hoskin Tatskum, yes, Vorosh Baner, Tatmanelum Hairen, Vor Hayahos Neka Gert Mogner, and Nimpes Haskanan. Before I get to uh, main of my speech, I just want to say that. Uh, I appreciate the statement about uh, your feeling for, for, for the 60% of Glendale residents. Um, and yes, I know that we live in a market economy, but last time I checked, we don't live in a, if I have a lot of money, I, can, I get to legally and predictably destroy people's lives economy. And that's what we're fighting to prevent. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, you have the livelihoods of 60% uh, of your constituents on one hand, and inconveniencing greedy landlords. And note, not even all the landlords, just the greedy ones, who are less than 1% on the other hand. If you are unsure about this, you do not deserve to be in those seats. Just pause and think. By allowing rents to be out of control, you are making our grandmothers and grandfathers in Glendale choose between food and housing. Rent control, 
Moreover, you protect landlords who want to profit from our grandmothers and grandfathers' inability to buy food. I'd like to think that you don't consider 60% of your, of your constituents second-rate citizens and that you actually care for our city. So I want to help you with a roadmap. Put a temporary cap on rent increases, a freeze rather, um, to mirror the CPI uh, for two years starting now uh, with the possibility of extension. Uh, if a comprehensive rent control ordinance is still not ready to be passed since I know the city's report back and recommendation process can, can be long. Um, and agendize and start the process to passing a strong rent control ordinance in the city. Nothing, and I mean nothing on your agenda is as important as passing rent control now. rent control uh, I'd like to invite, uh, therefore, I'd like to invite members of the audience to join us outside as we organize for rent control in Glendale. Thank you, Mike. Mike Mohill. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. Good I want to first, uh, on the, off, the, off the clock, please thank you sure. for the time and also congratulations on your new thank appointment. You, sir. Hope you make more money. No? Oh, uh, that's too Regrettably. bad. There's more responsibility. Yeah. I got you. Put me on the clock now, please. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good evening, Council Members. My name is Mike Mohill. Councilman Devine, please direct staff to present a report on the finances of the Americana in layman language and not like the reporting in the city financial report, CAFRA. Please make the report easy to read and not cumbersome for the public to understand. Also, please agendize the Americana finances so we can have a public discussion on this important investment by Glendale taxpayers. I'm sure Councilman Agajanian would second your motion. Putting information on the city website would be good, but actually, how many people go to the city website unless they are looking for something specific? For the record, between the years 1980 through 2004, the city spent over $77 million to purchase the 15.5 acres of land needed to build the town center, later called the Americana at Brand. The city of Glenda gave this land free and clear to Rick Caruso so he could use the land as collateral in order to secure a $440 million bank line of credit to build the Americana. By the time the city gave this 15.5 acres of property to Rick Caruso in 2005, this prime real estate had grown in over $300 million in value. In order for the city to acquire the 15.5 acres of business properties needed for the town center, the city had to float a $48 million bond. Taxpayers are currently paying $3.2 million per year in interest for the next 30 years on the bond. After 30 years, the taxpayers will be paying $96 million interest only, on, only to the bondholders. I guarantee that the city will tell the public that ever since the Americana was opened in 2008, the surrounding properties have been making money, but the Americana itself is not. Just like the Museum of Neon Art, which cost the Glendale taxpayers $6.5 million and is poorly attended. The city will present a dog and pony show in favor of the city because they will not want to show a detailed loss of the actual facts. Councilwoman Devine, again since 2008, when the Americana was open, please tell the public for each year the net income after all expenses have been paid by the city. That is, interest on the $48 million bond. In other words, how much money has the city earned in net profit from the Americana itself? Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Moorhill. Do you want to 
sure. address that in any yeah, way? Yeah, I, I just want to say that uh, uh, Mr. Lorenz is here tonight, and I'm sure he's going to do the best he can at answering all these questions. Um, and I'll say that uh, we look for you to let your readers know where they can find this information. Thank you. Thank you, and I think it's a reasonable request that the information be presented in layman's terms. Yes. Because we're not, you know, we're presenting it here. It's not intended for accountants or finance, finance professionals. So, I do want to go back to the issue of the marijuana, um, the legalization of cannabis, because just two days ago, or three days ago, all of us, or four of us, were at uh, ICA, and one of the pretty detailed and in-depth presentations there was about uh, cannabis in Los Angeles, and the head of the Department of Cannabis something, cannabis legalization or cannabis uh, regulation, was there presenting it to the elected officials that were in attendance. And the numbers were quite staggering. Apparently, Los Angeles currently has 900 legal cannabis stores and has 150 that are in consideration to be legalized. That doesn't take into account all the illegal, uh, unregistered cannabis stores that are functioning there. And I'm talking about simply just the city of Los Angeles, not all the other outlying um, 88 or so cities. And this process has moved forward. It, it, it is quite advanced, actually. And it's all around us. I think it's clear to all of us that there are you know, no real borders between Glendale and its neighboring cities, Burbank, Los Angeles, La Cañada, La Crescenta, Pasadena. We're not going to build a wall. Uh, it's just not going to happen. We don't do that kind of thing to keep people out. And as one of the speakers ironically mentioned, there are, there's a myriad of delivery systems. Uh, uh, you know, you can take, I guess you can take your phone and go, if you have an app, go to an app and order it, and they'll deliver it to you in 20 minutes. So it's happening. It's, I mean, we can, we say, it, it sounds nice when we say, oh, it's not, it's not allowed in Glendale. Well, it's allowed in the state of California. And the state of California rules and laws are paramount including the city of Glendale. And it's happening. Folks are ordering them. This stuff is coming in, going out. There's a free flow of it because it's impossible to regula regulate it when you don't even want to admit the fact that it's there. And right now, we're sort of in that status. We're, we're sort of pretending like it's not there. But of course, it's everywhere. Just wanted to put that out there. I don't know if my colleagues want to add anything. But you were there at the presentation. You heard this machine in LA is is sophisticated. It's it's and gears are moving at high speed. We're talking about the city of Los Angeles, which is all around us. And, and the amount of uh, <clears throat> the amount of uh, regulation, there there they must have had ten ordinances, uh, four committees. I mean, it's a, a lot city of city commission, lot of, e everything. A lot of um, uh, manpower uh, to regulate it. Uh, their ordinance calls for one. Uh, dispensary for every 10,000 people. That means that in the city of Glendale, we would allow 200 dispensaries. And I, I just like blown away on that one. So, um, but it's, it was the most well attended session. It was the of, most of well the attended weekend. session was ever that, I showed up. Yeah, yeah. It was, uh, it was interesting and uh, I, a lot of information uh, given to us about it. And uh, as the mayor says, we're in. Uh, we're in that stage right now where we're just kind of trying to take in all the information, no decision being made. and uh, Meanwhile, not regulating it, really. Correct. We're, we're, right. we're, by, by pretending that it's not happening and we don't have it here, we're giving up the right to regulate this. So, anything? Okay, that's it. So we'll move on to the next item, which is adoption of ordinance or action items. Mr. Mayor and Council, item 8A is Director of Finance regarding Glendale Quality of Life and Essential Services Protection Measure. 8A1 is a resolution calling and giving notice of a special municipal election to be held on Tuesday, November 6, 2018, by submitting to the voters the Glendale Quality of Life and Essential Services Protection Measure, an ordinance of the City of Glendale to adopt a three-quarter percent uh, transactions and use tax and declaring an emergency 
uh, with respect thereto. Uh, item two is an introduction of ordinance to enact a quarter percent local transaction and use sales tax to be administered by the California Department of Tax and Fee Administrator subject to adoption by the electorate. Three is a resolution requesting the Board of Supervisors of the County of Los Angeles to consolidate a special municipal election to be held on Tuesday, November 6, 2018 with the statewide general election to be held on the same date, authorizing City Clerk to carry out all the necessary procedures for said election working with the County of Los Angeles. Four is a resolution calling for arguments for and against the revenue measure for the ballot for the special election on Tuesday, November 6, 2018. Five is a motion making appointments to write ballot arguments for and against ballot measure. Six is a resolution of appropriation approving $485,000 in adjustments to the adopt the fiscal year 2018-19 budget. And that is all for that item. Okay, thank you, yes. So Mr. Mayor, yes. members uh, of the City Council, thank you for this opportunity. We're uh, before you this evening to discuss placing a measure on the November ballot to protect uh, Glendale's quality of life and essential services and giving the opportunity for the City Council to have the control of making decisions uh, regarding local tax dollars to remain in the City of Glendale for essential services that are needed here in Glendale. Glendale has uh, for 112 years uh, provided prided itself uh, for being fiscally prudent uh, and having these policies in place uh, based on city councils that have been before you, including the city council today, and have given uh, direction to staff to make sure that these fiscally prudent policies are in place and embraced on an annual basis. From the effects of Prop 13 uh, on Glendale because of its conservative fiscal approach, Glendale receives 13 cents on the dollar. Um, whereas Burbank and Pasadena receive 18 cents and 21 cents on the dollar uh, and, and Glendale remains uh, behind the ball on that. We provide exceptional services to our 204,000 plus uh, individuals who live in this community and the 200 to 300,000 people who visit, work, and play in this community on a daily basis. Uh, there isn't an infinite amount of revenues uh, that you know uh, of that we know of that come to us uh, for the important council directives that are in place for this community. Um, however, the city council and staff have made significant cuts to the city's budget over the last 10 years, especially with the recession um, that all cities um, uh, and organizations have experienced throughout our nation. From cuts to soft services uh, and community services and parks and libraries to 20 plus uh, officers that have been cut over the years, Things have slowed down in the city of Glendale, code enforcement in your neighborhoods, to sidewalk and street repairs. Um, I don't want to paint a picture that the sky is falling because the sky isn't falling and, and as you know, we are very transparent and we have a very transparent budget process on an annual basis where the city council, uh, the staff and the community have discussions regarding the policy directives of the city council. However, there are needs in place and those needs will continue to grow. Um, and the revenue stream does not uh, sustain that growth. Uh, infrastructure needs that I mentioned earlier that include streets, sidewalks. Uh, we are 112 years old, uh, as I said earlier, and, and based on that age, um, there are significant needs in maintenance and repair uh, and replacement, and, and that maintenance, repair, and replacement is key to making sure that the quality of life services uh, remain in this community. We want to continue being the fourth uh, safest city uh, in California as well as the sixth safest in, in the nation. There are affordable housing needs as, as uh, you continue to hear on a weekly basis, not just here at the dais, but from the constituents that, that call, email, and visit you. Those affordable housing needs continue, whether it's for seniors, families, and others, and the council wants to continue to support that. Um, this city council and staff have not contemplated um, having a measure in place that would increase our, our sales tax in the past uh, that I'm aware of. Why now? Um, and I think I, I've covered some of those items now, but I think what you will see in Mr. Elliott's presentation um, is the why now is that, that Glendale produces um, significant sales tax dollars and we end up paying those tax dollars out to the county and other agency agencies 
um, and the importance of, of the city council having that local control stay within the city of Glendale within the three quarter percent that will be discussed that is still available to the city to remain here and for you to have that opportunity to make those very important policy decisions versus other agencies and the county. And so today we're before you to, to share some information regarding how sales tax happens, what the breakdown is, um, what other agencies receive from the city of Glendale, uh, what we ultimately get back from the other agencies for the programs here, and it is not commensurate to the amount that you're paying out uh, to, to the county and other agencies. And with that, Mr. Mayor and members of the city council, I'd, I'd like to ask Mr. Elliott uh, to provide you some information uh, regarding what's before you this evening, and uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions after that. Thank you. Before Mr. Elliott starts his presentation, I, I do want to tell those in the audience and also our residents, whoever is watching, that to bring an increase of taxes um, to, to even discuss it is absolutely counterintuitive. It's illogical. It's not anything that any elected official ever wants to do, and yet here we are doing it. And Pasadena did it yesterday, same issue. Burbank is doing it tonight, same exact issue. All, all three cities are looking to take control over their own tax dollars before those same tax dollars are taken over by an entity other than the city and used for uh, purposes other than city's immediate needs. Uh, I hope that you follow this presentation very closely because it's, it's very logical. If you, if you follow it, you'll get it. We're, we're trying to make sure that the monies that, it's not a matter of whether these taxes will be levied. It's a matter of who's going to levy them. If we don't do it, the county will and the state will. They've proven it through their actions. They've already eaten into our local use, 2% uh, local use uh, limit by taking over uh, one and a quarter percent of those 2%. And all that's left is the three quarters of a percent. And we're just trying to preserve that, make sure that those monies are used exclusively for our residents, for our city. So with that, Mr. Elliott, yes. If we can discuss this briefly, I would like to okay. express myself. I'm against the raising the taxes, whether it's 0.75% sales tax, but the problem is whether the LA County or other agencies will come and steal this money anyway. So that's why I will agree with this, but I wanna make sure this money will go to a special account. And it's not gonna be, although it's called uh, general, I think it's uh, general tax, but it should be in a special account and we have to supervise every dollar of it, how we gonna spend it. Otherwise, we know government or other agencies, they are good at uh, spending the money fast. And I expect that uh, we are in good econ economy and as usual, uh, recession is in the horizon. It's right next year or year after will happen. So that's why I wanna make sure these tax dollars, whatever we collect, will be separated from other general fund tax in separate account. And every time, uh, my wish was that to spend this money for affordable housing. That's my wish, well, but I was told if you say specifically what you're gonna use it for, then you, ha you need two third of uh, public to vote on it and ratify it. So that's why I step back and say, okay, let's uh, go ahead with what uh, has been uh, organized. But I wanna make sure to be on the record that this money will not gonna go to pay, I'm sorry, for the employees or other stuff, or I don't know, whatever you name it. This should be specifically for the benefit of the public. They pay the taxes and they have to see that this tax has been collected for their benefit, not anybody else, not for the city council salary or employee's salary or anybody else's salary or any other expenses. I be against it and I hope the public will be against it uh, and I'm sure they are against it. They wanna see that 
whatever they pay, the taxes that, that they're gonna pay more to be returned to them uh, as a benefit to them. So that's my concern and I wanted to be on the record on this. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, if I can just state based on yeah. the um, feedback we received at the last meeting we had initially to uh, discuss this item with you about a month ago, uh, Mr. Alajanian uh, brought this uh, item forward and, and his desire to make sure that the funds are in a separate line item account. As you all know, uh, it is a general fund uh, resource that would come in and that resource would go into the general fund. However, as a separate line item, it can be uh, as a separate line item, the money's coming in, would come into that line item. The council, as you see on an annual basis, would see that line item and could and will make decisions on how that, uh, all of those funds are spent on an annual basis, separate and apart from uh, any other discussion that you may have on the general fund. However, it is a general fund uh, resource, again, uh, based on the way that we have it here, and you would make those decisions on an annual basis. Staff couldn't make those decisions in a vacuum without the council direction and appropriation. Right, so this, this issue was discussed in the past, like you said a month ago. It'll go into the general fund, however, council will administer it during the budgeting process, and will ultimately decide how it's going to be used. One way or another, any monies that are spent in the city of Glendale, I hope, are spent for the benefit of its residents, no matter what shape they take. And it doesn't have to be money that's used to uh, service a park or uh, provide services or pay salaries. At the end of the day, those salaries, even the salaries are paid for the benefit of the residents so that we can have the employees to run the city. But uh, obviously we understand that this money, we, we don't want to levy monies from our residents for the sake of spending it we want to make sure that someone else doesn't levy those monies and spend it on other cities. And we'll be very careful with how the money is spent, assuming that we even vote for it, we support it. So with that, we'll move to Bob Elliott to present this to us and to the public. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, um, before we get started, I really want to uh, do a shout out to uh, Armin Harkalian who spent a lot of time putting this data and information together, so I really appreciate his efforts. Um, as uh, Yasmin said, uh, we were here uh, June 12th and uh, discussed this issue. Council wanted it brought back, so I'll give a little bit of background, um, but I will go through it fairly um, quickly since a lot of it is repetitive. Um, there's a 70.75% uh, uh, allowance left um, that could uh, be a general purpose tax for the city of Glendale with the approval simple majority of our residents. Uh, the uh, election would be held November 6th um, and the tax would take effect April uh, 1st of 2019. Three quarters of a percent uh, in the city of Glendale would generate about $30 million. Um, and as such, that tax would be, as was stated by council um, just recently, uh, it would stay within the city of Glendale and not go to another agency, and we'll talk about that in, in terms of where our other special taxes, sales tax go. Um, and it would be used for city services, as the mayor um, has suggested, as through the uh, annual budget process as determined by the city council. So currently our sales tax in the city of Glendale is nine and a half percent. Uh, it's obviously authorized by the uh, California Constitution. It's administrated by the uh, CDTFA, um, used to be called the State Board of Equalization. Uh, they collect the tax on everybody's behalf and parse it out to all the recipients uh, every quarter. Uh, of that 9.5% of the uh, sales tax, the city now receives 1% uh, in general tax uh, via the Bradley Burns uh, sales tax uh, law, uh, and it can be used for any purpose within the general fund. That 1% equates to about $40 million every year, um, and we stated before that 9.5 could be increased to 10 and a quarter uh, for local use um, within the city of Glendale. Uh, we have heard uh, within that uh, margin that we have, and I'll show that in a minute, there's a 2% margin allowed for local government 
Uh, of that, the uh, county has a one and a quarter percent um, for um, Measure R, Measure M, and Measure H uh, currently uh, going through that. And then uh, we have heard that AQMD is proposing a 0.25% uh, uh, sales tax uh, for air quality projects, and LA County is testing the likelihood of a sales tax for homeless uh, housing measures. So the breakdown on the stack chart um, shows what it currently is now. Again, um, the city gets its 1% general fund allocation within this uh, seven and a quarter uh, state mandated. The other uh, voted in special taxes right now are major R, major M, and those um, are not, oh, I'm sorry, pardon me, I misstated earlier. Those are not included in the cap. They, they got special um, permission to, to exceed the cap within the local amounts. Prop A and Prop C uh, apply to the local cap along with Measure H. Um, and that's the one and a quarter percent that goes against our 2% cap for local. So of those five taxes, uh, Prop A, Prop C, Measure uh, R, M, and H generates about $90 million. Um, and we stated that last, uh, last month when we went and reviewed this. Uh, oddly enough, um, as I watched the Pasadena presentation this afternoon, um, and their numbers, uh, although a little bit less than ours, they generate uh, a return of 16.8% back to their city for those five taxes where we get 16.7%. So we're about exactly the same in terms of what money comes back into the city of Glendale uh, from those five special taxes. Um, what does that look like graphically? Um, based off our 1819 estimates, each of those uh, five special um, sales tax, um, Prop AC, Measure RM, which are all transportation based, and Measure H, um, which is for homeless. Um, these are allocated all in different methodologies, but at the end of the day, we receive a, a, a small per capita allowance along with some uh, project-based money shown in, in the purple. And then uh, Measure H is on uh, homeless count uh, caseload. Uh, again, uh, you can see the disproportionate amount of money that is generated in Glendale uh, versus what is received back in the yellow and the purple down below. Again, we get back only about 16.7% or one-sixth of the money generated within the city of Glendale. So moving forward, the proposal is um, to uh, potentially put a three-quarter percent sales tax on the ballot, raising it up to 10 and a quarter percent. Uh, that would give us, as we've stated, uh, $30 million for general fund use to address some of the issues, um, either items that have been cut in the past um, for quality of life services or um, police and fire safety, um, again, all through the city council annual budget process. The stack chart, if we were to enact that three quarter cent allowance would add this piece up on the top and, f and complete uh, the 2% uh, local cap for the total of 2%, uh, uh, 0 0.75 coming back in the local um, and the other one and a quarter going to the special tax. As we showed um, previously, there's a number of cities that already have uh, uh, local taxes in place. Um, a, number, a number of them uh, additional uh, came in the June election that were added onto this list. These, these have been in place quite a while. Interesting uh, enough, today I was looking, um, trying to re-verify all this information, found that the city of La Mirada had a 1% local tax that expired uh, in March, um, and their rate went down the 1%, but went right back up uh, 0.25 because Measure H kicked in because there wasn't an allowance for it previously. Um, so even if they wanted to bring it back, they were only allowed to um, put 0.75 now because Measure H kicked in. Um, as was stated, Pasadena uh, proved their um, putting it on the ballot um, last night, and I uh, believe uh, Burbank is doing it uh, at the same time we are. Um, just to recap in total, um, graphically what it would look like if we generate that 0.75 in Glendale, we get the full return versus the other five where we're generating that 90% or $90 million and getting back very little. Combining them all, 
90 million that we generate for the special tax, we get back the um, 15 uh, million down below versus if we generate 30, we keep 30, obviously. Um, the title we chose for this was the Quality of Life Protection, uh, Essential Service Protection Measure. Um, and that really was to address a lot of the things. The 10 years I've been here, uh, I think the first six or seven, we did nothing but cut. Um, and it, it, it had a toll on the agency, and, and I'm sure um, a lot of you will recall the, the angst of going through the budget process and, and programs that were cut or uh, reduced significantly. Um, we stretched out capital projects um, to the point where we didn't have any money going into capital at all. Um, uh, and we, we met the, the challenge in terms of balancing the budget. We presented balanced budgets every year um, to the city council. Um, again, uh, we had to do that. The, the charter states we have to do that. Um, but we looked at um, different uh, ways to um, address things. Um, there was innovation in terms of the fire department, for example, uh, creating the BLS program. Uh, allowing us to reduce the number of sworn um, firefighters. Um, there were cuts throughout all the different departments. We eliminated um, well over uh, th 300 uh, uh, staff, uh, full-time staff from the city, um, about 181, I think, in that time frame in the general fund. We pushed out a lot of things, uh, delayed uh, cut staff and code enforcement, park and recreation and the like. Um, we've had various cost-saving strategies um, throughout uh, the time, and just to show the recap of what, what departments cut, um, over $20 million in the four years, um, showing up here 2008-9 through 2012-13. Uh, um, we had uh, a few cuts um, the following two years, and then after that we actually added back a little bit based off uh, some revenue growth, but overall a lot of things were cut. Um, again, to reiterate some of the specific sworn personnel in the fire department, uh, there was a reduction in police, police officers, uh, community, uh, police community outreach programs, SROs were, were cut down. We added two back this year, but um, still less than what we had originally. Uh, we reduced hourly wages, contractual services, um, a lot of hours of operations. Um, the libraries were closed on holidays, which equated to about 13 days a year. Uh, we reduced uh, funding for sidewalk and, and uh, street repair uh, maintenance throughout the city. Um, we eliminated CIP funding um, from the general fund. Uh, recall that uh, years ago, 50% of the sales tax used to go into the CIP fund. Um, in the early um, 2000s, there was down to about 14%. Um, we reduced that down to zero, um, <laughs> fortunately when I got here. Um, we're now back up to 2% uh, going back into our Fund 401, um, certainly far less than, than uh, what we used to contribute to that fund. That equated to us pushing out projects for years and years and years to do a fire station upgrade or a park upgrade or trying to go find a federal grant or some other means to fund those projects. And we've been fairly successful in that, but still there is really not a huge flow of, of money for capital projects. Uh, to a uh, brief recap of the five-year forecast, while we're projecting conservative but solid revenue growth throughout the uh, uh, coming four, uh, five years, uh, we showed this in a little bit more detail in the uh, budget study sessions, but moving out in subsequent years, we're looking at budget deficits, and the choice is we can address those through budget cuts or we can address it through some revenue growth. And it'll probably be a combination of, of both, but um, our cost structure is increasing, and, and a lot of that is due to PERS and other, other uh, contractual obligations. Um, but our revenue sources are solid based off our property tax, the housing values, um, our sales tax is very strong. Um, so it's, it's not horrific relative to what it was uh, in 2008-09, um, but we still keep an eye on that five-year forecast to make sure that we will present a balanced budget to, to the council in the future. Easy. I guess you have mentioned before 
why is in uh, 2019, 2020, we have deficits? That's based off the, the revenue for, that we have forecasted for next year and what we think our costs will be, as they are today, we would have a slight deficit in the general fund. This is no. not considered if there is a recession even. This is a uh, good economy, right? Well, yeah, but we do hedge a little bit in our revenue forecast, so we don't go, you know, if the trend is, you know, 5%, we probably would estimate 35 or 4 depending on the revenue, um, because there is always the chance of a, of a recession coming, and we had that discussion today about, you know, the looming potential recession coming in 2019, 2020, because um, that's everything you read, there's something's going to happen, and it has always been cyclical. Um, hopefully it will not, won't be a 2008 nine type of recession um, and it'll be a mild one but yes you are absolutely correct our cost structure as you recall in our budget study sessions is fairly fixed um, 80 percent of the general fund is people um, providing services whether that's police fire uh, parks employee library employees so if we need to reduce that line item that's really cutting staff is what it boils down to to, to match that revenue So just to recap again, that 75.75% uh, would uh, generate $30 million. It would be up to the council, as we've said, uh, through the budget process to um, program that money, uh, hopefully addressed and pointed towards the quality of life uh, factors that we have in the various departments, uh, improvement in our public infrastructure, whether it be sidewalk or street maintenance or our facilities with our parks and libraries. Um, it could be addressed and used for affordable housing um, or whatever other program that council sees fit. It will be obviously part of our annual audit. We have an audit every year that's mandated in the charter. Um, and the important thing is we've said it will keep the revenue um, local and uh, for the council to decide what those um, dollars are spent on. Again, graphically that $30 million um, relative to what uh, we get for the other five taxes. So what are the... You know, I'm sorry, I have to interrupt. Sure. Um, and I sort of bit my tongue. I don't believe that really is an accurate representation about the return that the city of Glendale gets from the Measure R and the Measure M taxes. That might be the local return that we get, but it certainly does not represent the amount of money that comes into this city from those things. At a later date, Next week, I'd like to sit down with you and Armin, sure. and let's straighten this out because I'm, you know, I'm getting bashed on the head here, and I'm taking it kind of personally. Being a representative on the Metro Board, I know that there is so much more money coming into this city on Measure M and Measure R. I see our assistant city manager nodding his head as well. For this purpose, this might be good, but don't bash the agency that I represent also with this sort of a gross understatement of the return that Glendale gets from the Measure M and the Measure R funding. Sorry, this was the last. I mean, I was not gonna say anything, but if you hit me- No, I no, 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 no. Hey, I, I completely understand, but just to qualify, this is what we know as of today that we're getting for 2018-19, and there could be project money in the pipeline that skew this up a little higher um, in future years, and in past years we have received more project money. Again, this is a snapshot for 1819, and I, I agree with your comment. I don't disagree with it. So. And Councilwoman, I, I know exactly what you're saying. We know how hard you fight for those dollars to come into Glendale, um, and and so in no way do we want to diminish um, any of uh, of the fights that you've had throughout well, the years sort of, to make sure. You know, in a graphic sense, uh, it's one year. <laughs> No, but let's let's get those numbers right. I mean, we have, especially if yeah, we have. No, no, I mean, according to council member Nigerian, these aren't the right numbers. I'm, I'm not saying right now. I'm saying we need to know what the right numbers are because as we present it to, as as it's being presented to us and the and the residents, it looks very dramatic, and we need to know just how dramatic it is. I mean, if if there's more money coming back from Measure R and Measure M, we should know about it. Well, I, I'll, again, let me qualify it. This is for 2018-19 of what we know today. 
Have we gotten more in projects in years past? Yes, uh, depending on, on what the project was for, for the buses or, or what have you. Um, and we may get further, uh, further project money this year, but as of when we did the budget this year, this is what we well, how about expected. Last year? And, and the numbers that, that you see, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, um, as it relates to, to the 90 million, all measures 12, and the um, purple, which is the sub-regional sub return, is, is the 3 million. By way of example, measure R, you know, there are local monies that are allocated to the City of Glendale. Um, and those local dollars are, are included in this. But there's regional dollars that are also allocated. Mm -hmm. And through the region, that region will include the city of Glendale as well, but it's regional dollars that are allocated um, to the region and not specifically only to the city of Glendale. And so the, the monies that you are seeing today, those dollars are accurate. Um, and it ha it's specific to the city of Glendale um, and the allocations received for each of these measures. And you know, we utilized Measure R as an example. Um, and uh, the project-based measures that I'm sure uh, Mr. Najarian is, is referring to. But um, we'll sit down and, and talk about okay. all of those numbers and, and do a breakdown to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, Let me ask this question. Yes. Why are we using 2018-19 estimates when we can look back at 2018, well, if you, 17, if you 18, or 16, 17, and okay, so I think this is a better matrix if we have the, the actual numbers from previous years. Uh, I went past, here it is, measure R. So you can see, and this is what, uh, from the presentation we did back in June, um, the project money is in purple, which is the sub-regional allocation that we went through, um, based off the history and the, the um, per capita allocation is in the yellow we have received more money in past years based off the projects but it's um, as you can see the per capita is fairly consistent the project spikes whenever the project is is approved and and um, gets um, distributed out to the various cities and agencies this is one this is a slide I had in the you guys don't have this one I had it we had this slide as the five-year history in our in our previous presentation um, that we did on June the 12th. Okay. Um, we don't have that slide. I, I, we didn't include it, but I had I had it on the we had it in in the parking lot just for for this very reason. And these are the the various re uh, years, and at the at the best year, which w which would have been 2012-13. Right. We got 6.3 million uh, in uh, sub-regional allocation, which is project based. We had 1.6 the following year, 1.8, 1.2, and then 4.6. So it, it kind of ebbs and flows depending on the projects, but uh, Councilman Nigerian is right. The slice of 18-19 of is fairly low based on what we know today in terms of uh, project money that we will receive. The regional, as we're referring to, the region, the sub-regional regional allocation, that's a way of saying it's a, a program that impacts the whole region and we happen to be included in it. Yeah. Correct. So therefore it's hard to measure the financial benefit that the city receives because it's for everyone. Is that correct. a fair estimate? Okay. Right. Is that, the, that's your role ever do though, uh, LA County JPA? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, yeah, member city council. Glendale is part of a six city consortium that are part of the Arroyo Verdugo subregion. We do receive direct funding from Measure R based on projects, and like Mr. Elliott mentioned, 18, 19, we were mostly in the planning stages, so next year we'll see a, an impressive flow of monies because the projects will be underway. Next year meaning 1920? 1920, yeah. Okay. Okay, so would you, yeah, stay on that slide and you know, I, I don't want to get bogged down on this, but it, it is an important <laughs> yeah. point. It's an important point because we're making an argument to our yeah. residents as to why it's the right thing to do to increase these taxes. So we need to make sure that the numbers that we're presenting, or at least the message that we're presenting is, is the correct one. And looking back, historically looking back, at least the, the local return amounts, the, uh, the ones that are specifically allocated to Glendale, are relatively modest numbers, at least under Measure R. I don't know if you have the same matrix for Measure M. And of course, Measure M is new. Right, so we, yeah, have, we, we haven't got it. 
Mr. Mayor, um, if I may add to Please. that, um, if we could go back to Measure R, uh, just for clarification, the uh, the yellow is the local return that we get per capita um, per the, the the population. The uh, the purple one, the sub-regional uh, council member Anjarin is correct. Uh, that's more on the competitive basis. So we're not really given that money. Um, our staff has to go out and uh, and apply for that. Um, and, and again, it's on a competitive basis. So and if the cities don't apply for it, for it for then us. they're not going to get it. Yes, yes, Mr. That money is out there just because we haven't drawn on it certainly does not mean that we don't have the projects available or that we're going to get that money. Absolutely and my correct. point is, um, I think it's a rather misleading uh, graphic that we're showing, and it indicates that the city is getting screwed out on transportation money when it certainly is not the case. But let's talk about that another day. We can bring in some uh, sure. of the metro finance people, I, and we I can. I think we should. Yeah, we should definitely do that. We can clear that up, but not right now. This but is but not but it. definitely, I knew, you know, Measure R and Measure M have very large regional transportation projects. For example, West Santa Ana branch, Eco Rapid Transit, which I chair, is one of them that benefits from both Measure R and Measure M. But West Santa Ana branch does not reach Glendale. It's the future, sort of the northern leg of Eco Rapid Transit, which will reach Glendale, and that's in the future. These mega projects that are worth billions of dollars right now don't touch Glendale. So Glendale doesn't benefit from those mega measure R, uh, measure R, measure M projects, just a fact. Well, I mean, there's a probably a $300 million project, the bus rapid transit connecting Pasadena, Glendale, and Burbank. Uh, how are you going to figure that in? Uh, that's going to blow, you know, I don't know how you, you would allocate it, but Glendale's in the mix there. So that's a project. The planning is, uh, the EIR is being formulated. We're going to be discussing that soon. So that would blow it right off the charts uh, if that project comes, when that project is done. It's going to be many years of multiple millions of dollars, in, you know, being spent in the city. We as a city council don't have that checkbook, but that's right. being spent in the city. So I, I don't disagree with you Listen, at all. Man, I, I, I'm I think just the point is trying to show you, show you what right. was and what we know for 1819. We'll make sure to have and more of a historical perspective as, right. as we're showing these numbers. Um, to make sure that, that um, you know, and you as well as the community thing, yeah, understand. Last thing, be, you know, we should move on, but um, if we can have that uh, report and have Metro folks come, come over and, and give us their presentation, uh, it's a good, I think, good way for us to lobby also the streetcar and why some monies from Measure R and Measure M should, should be diverted towards Glendale to fund the, the streetcar. That's, that's an, I think, it's an important project that at least this council is unanimous about and would really change the dynamic of public transportation in the city of Glendale. But that's for another meeting. Let's move on. So next steps, uh, if council approves this tonight, um, we will move forward to put it on the November 6th ballot. Uh, we have to have arguments for and against uh, for the proposed measure. Um, you will have to authorize the city manager to contract with the uh, CDTFA to administer uh, the tax, and we'll go forward from there. Questions, comments? Questions? We have a, a speaking card, so we'll take uh, one, only one card on a tax measure. That's great. Okay, Mike Mohill. I'll open the public hearing. Close the Good evening, hearing. council members. The name is Mike Mohill. <laughs> council members, before you is action item eight. Director of Finance reference Glendale quality of life and essential services protection measure. I would like, a, I'd like you to humbly ask you the question. This question, whose quality of life and essential services protection are you talking about? Is it for the struggling homeowners, renters and landlords? small, large businesses in the city of Glendale? Who? You are proposing to increase Glendale sales tax an additional three quarters of a percent. 
This is in addition to the new annual firebrush fee of $15 and sewer operating fees, among other fees and taxes you approve in this current fiscal year budget. Where will the additional revenue go? We'll go for parks, library, street maintenance, senior program, public transportation, et cetera. No, no, no. It will go, and you know it. The first obligation of government is to pay for the contracts that you have negotiated with our CALPERS overpaid workforce. Over the past 10 years, the average city employee's pension benefit was $150,000 every year. After 30 years of service, and our city employees can retire at the ripe old age of 50 or 55. When our city workforce retire, the taxpayers of Glendale will have to come up with over $2 billion of unfunded retirement money pension. In 2017, according to Transparent California, the total pay and benefits for a few of our current former and current city employees are former chief of police, Roberto Castro. His salary was 451,000 in 2017. Gregory Fish, fire chief, $385,000 a year. William Lynch, $375,000 a year. Former city manager, Scott Ochoa, his salary was $375,000 a year. Mr. Steve Zern, general manager, GWP, $349,000 a year. Carl Probolitis, former police uh, uh, captain, but now a uh, chief of police, his salary in 2017 was $345,000 a year. Mike Garcia, our current city manager, $345,000 a year. Attaboy, Mike. Matt Doyle, director of human resources, $285,000 a year. John Warner, electrical line mechanic supervisor, $316,000. Rubik Golanian, former director of public works and is now assistant city manager. Congratulations, sir. Phil Lanzapain, Director of Community Service, $296,000. And we, then the Yasmin Beers, our current uh, city manager, back in 2017 was making $376,000. Congratulations, ma'am. Total pay and benefits. Ladies and gentlemen, the viewing audience, the problem with the city of Glendale is not revenue, it's the expense. And we have overpaid city employees. This rat hole will never be filled. They want more money from the taxpayers, the Glenda, and you must say no at the ballot box. Please say no. Send a message to City Hall. Up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moyle. Mr. Moyle, can I ask you a question? Will, will you be happy if the county takes that money? Because they're already taking a percent and a quarter, and all, all, Mayor, all that's left is the three Mayor Sinyani, and I'll do respect. Whatever money you take from Glendale taxpayers, it goes into the general fund, does it not? I'm just asking you, you sim a simple question. The county's going to take it. Go. Um, and I'm you just can, asking you. You can go to the senior programs, all this stuff, okay. and you know, right, and it's for you. the children. I'll ask you a simple question, but you don't No, answer. sir. Okay. Let's thank talk you. about Glendale. I can't control the county. Thank you. Neither can you. But we can control uh, yes, what's going on and see the Glendale. Yes, we can, and that's what we're going to do right now. Well, and let me tell you, I'm going to advise my people to vote no on this measure. Thank you. I, I was hoping you'd explain why, but you, you didn't. But thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moyle. Did I not? No, you, you didn't answer the question. Going, the money's going for the salaries and the pensions of our union workforce. But if it goes to the salaries and ex expenses of the county workforce, will you be happy about that? Again, I can't control the county, sir. We're going to do that right now. OK. Watch. OK, thank you. OK, uh, do we have? It's a, this is a tax measure. This is amazing. And there's only one card that was submitted. <laughs> Maybe indicative of, of uh, whether this is a good thing to do or not. So I'll, you know, I'll open it to my colleagues. I think a few of us have already expressed our views. Mr. Well, Majeri. Uh, you know, I just want to reiterate, um, I, am, I am against uh, taxing. Uh, the problem with that statement is um, it's not made in a vacuum. Uh, it is it is clear that 
the county or other agencies, whether it's the AQMD, it may be uh, you know, a multitude of other agencies have the ability and are ready to impose that additional tax burden on us. Uh, it will be too late for us to act at that time. This, as, as paradoxical as it seems, that we have to, I would encourage the council to place this on the ballot, and I would encourage the voters to accept this 0.75% uh, tax increase so we control the destiny of that money because they're going to swoop in and take it from us, and we won't have any say about it. So that, for that and all the other reasons that you discussed, uh, I'm very much in support of having a, uh, a segregated fund, a separate line item for this money so at budget time we can have a discussion with the whole community because budget is a community Im involved issue as to how we want to spend those revenues uh, should the measure pass before us. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Jillian. Ms. Councilwoman Devine. Okay. For, first, I want to thank staff for the report. This is an excellent report. Um, I encourage everyone that's watching this that uh, is a potential voter, uh, if this does uh, go to the um, uh, become a ballot measure, to read the staff report, uh, go to any of the outreach meetings that we have so that you fully understand uh, exactly the reason why we're doing this. None of us on this dais, I think, are for taxes. Uh, we are only trying to uh, give the voters a chance to weigh in and vote for this uh, potential um, uh, $30 million a year. So my decision is based on two perspectives. One, um, uh, as, as a council member, um, I look at this uh, possibility uh, and I feel it's my fiduciary responsibility to the residents uh, of Glendale uh, to let you know or to give you the opportunity to vote on this, this ballot measure. Um, staff has given us so many really good reasons, economic reasons, uh, for putting this on the ballot, for you voting for this uh, measure. Uh, one of which, of course, is because the funds will be aligned with uh, community um, priorities and quality of life um, uh, proposals and, and uh, efforts, needs that we have. As Councilman uh, Agajanian said, you know, we can use this for affordable housing, for parks, for um, uh, so many, so many different things. Uh, the city will uh, re retain all the monies that are accumulated from this tax. Uh, Whereas some of the other taxes that we're, we're only getting 1% of the 9.25% sales tax that we are collecting in this city, uh, that's, um, that's preposterous, I think. Uh, the county, as they've said, the county of Los Angeles is now already looking at measures to put on the ballot that's going to take this 0.75% uh, away from us, uh, take it out of our city and put it into other, other um um, efforts like homelessness, et cetera. Um, I think a, um, a really important, uh, uh, and I'm sorry Mr. Mulhill didn't uh, stay, but unlike a parcel tax or, the, or an obligatory uh, bond, uh, which uh, solely funded by Glendale property owners, much of this revenue, much of this sales tax revenue is going to be, um, is going to come from non-Glendale residents people that shop here and dine here from other places, other cities in, uh, in the area, people that work here in our city that don't live here. They are the ones that spend money in our city as well. So a lot of this tax money is going to be coming, revenue is going to be coming from them. Not, if not all of it is going to be coming from our own residents. So therefore, I, I really feel that uh, our residents should have an opportunity uh, to look at this, uh, this tax increase and, um, and, and make up their own minds. And, uh, you know, voting on a tax, uh, you know, measure, this is a right and a privilege that the state allows us. And this has to stay, this one is um, something that our voters have to, um, 
have to make a judgment call on. So I'm hoping that we get <coughs> all of the votes, the four votes that are necessary uh, to put this ballot, uh, this measure on a in a ballot um, to give our residents the opportunity uh, to uh, vote for this measure or against the measure, whatever they wish, but to keep this money in our community and not split it between cities that, uh, that either don't need it or have already reached the cap and they still get uh, funding. So um, I'm for approving uh, the ballot measure. Uh, yes, Councilman Bajanian. I just want to say about this issue again. We are saying local 0.75% sales tax for general city purpose. Actually, I'm worried about general city purpose, but however, and later in our report, it says quality of life. I don't want statements which is not clear what it is. This is so open and vague. Vague, it's not clear what we are talking about. Improvement of public infrastructure, okay. Affordable housing is more clear, those two. But the only assurance I have is and those who are watching us, there's one sentence here that I want to read to you because as I said, I'm worried whether it will be LA County or employees of this city or SCAQMD or AQMD, somebody will, will come and grab this 0.75 from us. They are good at it. They know how to grab the money and run away with it. But the only item here that I rely and I want to vote on this item is only one sentence which I read. Or as council determines each year through the budget process. This is the only thing that assures me that I would be involved with it and not to let this is spend on something which public who's paying the tax directly will not benefit from it. So I hope at the time, whenever we decide, if this approves, that my colleagues also will join me or I join them to make sure this money will be spent on issues that directly will affect the general public, specifically whether it's affordable housing, improvement of public infra infrastructure. As I said a little bit earlier, those who didn't see it, I spoke to our city attorney and I was told if you make it so specific, then you have to get two thirds of the vote of the public to approve this item. So that's why I will rely on this, that council determines each year through the budget process and they will, I will fight for you, whoever is watching this proceeding, that will be spent just for you, those who will pay the tax themselves. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, two questions for staff. Can these funds, if they're approved by our, if, if the tax increase is approved by our residents and the funds are levied, can the funds be used for, for example, affordable housing? Yes, Mr. Mayor, they can be. Okay, so unequivocally, yes. yes. Secondly, the ballot measure will have certain wording that will be brought to council for approval. Go ahead. Mr. Mayor, members of council, the wording <coughs> for the ballot measure is in the resolution. It's in already in yeah, the resolution. Yeah. And that, it has to be part of the resolution in order okay. for it to So let's look at the resolution. Sure. Because it's, I'm, it's, I'm, it's I, I want to make sure resolution. that our, sure. my, my colleagues are com as comfortable with this as possible. Sure. It's uh, at item 81. Um, and where, it's, where in, it's, it? in, it's in the, the box. the last page, second to last page of the resolution. And um, My, this right here? Yes, this box right here. 8A1, oh. under number three, section number three of the, or, of the resolution. Okay. And uh, just, uh, just. Can, read, can someone read that into? Out loud, you sure. Would you like? Me? You sure. Yes. And just so you know, the the we're restricted to seventy five words, and so and that, and that includes the measure plus the title of the measure. So it's measure, and then it will uh, the letter will be chosen 
later, uh, Glendale Quality of Life and Essential Services Protection Measure, uh, shall the measure to expand funding to protect essential services such as fire, paramedics, police, parks, recreation, senior, library, arts, and culture, and affordable housing programs and services, and to improve streets and sidewalks by enacting a three-quarter percent transaction and use sales tax that will generate approximately $30 million annually until ended by the voters with annual audits and all funds staying local be adopted. And Mr. Mayor, uh, I would note it's written this way. It has to be written. It has to start shall the measure and it has to end be local be adopted it has to it has to read that way pursuant to state law okay so this is a this is a broad uh, grouping of purposes for which correct and it, it, it's a, it's exemplary so it's it's, it's by it's example exempl right um, and at the end of the day council will be the one to determine which of these purposes the money should be used for yes. or or because others or, or others, others that or are others. not part of right. um, what's written here but as part of the yeah, measure yeah. because it is a general yeah. tax. Mm -hmm. This is same as the general budget. This is not what I was discussing before. This says, shall the measure to ex uh, expand funding to protect essential services. You didn't discuss essential paramedics, police, parks. Uh, this is not what we discussed for. When this, uh, you guys added to it. Uh, Mr. Mayor, this members. Not, I'm not happy with what you have written here. This is exactly the <coughs> same as you say general fund budget. What's the difference between general fund budget and this one, which we are putting more burden on this general public? We're saying what would you say? come and pay 0.75% more tax. And then we say same thing as general budget, wherever we spend. What do we have to do with... Uh, Services such as fire, paramedics, police, parks, recreation, I don't know, whatever. But what we meant was something that directly will affect them, such as affordable housing or yes. other services which fire, the person, safety, fire. You fire. have that fire and police sure, in it, and other city employees in your general budget fund. So you are repeating the same thing, creating a smaller same thing as the big one. We have big one, and we have a smaller one. This should be more uh, directed to. Like you said, we can't, we, we can't say it specifically for a specific use, because then that'll trigger the two-thirds requirement. So this is What I was saying before was like two items or three items, such as uh, affordable housing. But now became same as regular budget. Again, Mr. Mayor, members of the city yeah. council, um, council member Agajanian, just to make sure that we're all um, clear on, on kind of the, the wording on, on this. Um, again, because it's a general um, tax measure and the funds would go into the general fund, um, as we previously discussed on, on June 12th and, and in our discussions this evening, the way that the wording is written so that we cover ourselves, we say such things as. It doesn't mean that the council will be um, appropriating funds towards police or fire in a given year. Um, it may mean that in a given year you will allocate funding based on the fact that it will be um, separately accounted for to affordable housing for a big percentage of it in a particular year and infrastructure needs based on capital improvement needs that you deem necessary based on information provided to you to allocate. Now in another year, you may decide to allocate those funds to uh, soft services, community services and parks and libraries. That again is completely up to the city council to make those decisions and it's written in such a broad manner, again, because it is a general fund resource that would be coming in in terms of a revenue and we can't specify it so specifically to, let's say, affordable housing and maybe one or two other items. It has to be broadly generalized so that you're all covered um, under the, you know, kind of the, the law. Okay. So this measure does not mean that you're allocating it to police and fire. It's saying such things as. And again, you would have that discretion um, on an annual basis. Can, can I add something to that just um, put, put into perspective? Currently, uh, I agree with you that affordable housing is probably the most 
intense sort of area of need in our city. And I agree with you that any additional funds, if there was a priority item for which those funds should be allocated, the, the, the um, affordable housing should be up there uh, on, uh, at the top of the list. Five years from now, it may be another issue. And these funds that are being levied from our city residents and are being kept in this city should be used for that purpose, which is the most dire one, the most important one at that time. And frankly, it's irrelevant whether I'm there at that point, you're there, Nigerians there, Council Member Devine is there, because council will ultimately decide how that money is being spent. And council, individual council members, are the ones who are accountable to the voters. And we have to assume that council members at the time will make the right decision and will use those funds for those purposes that are most, most uh, essential and dire for the, for the residents. So uh, having a broad definition merely allows you room to maneuver. It doesn't mean that next year, for example, if this money is levied, we're going to be using it for any one of these things. It can, it can be any one of these things, but not specifically one or the other. And you may decide in any given year not to utilize some of the funds. Right and to keep those to funds keep those and funds. add it to a subsequent year because you're looking at a larger project down the road. Again, that is up to the city council. And, and I also think that the, the verbiage that's here on this, uh, uh, the measure, uh, helps the residents uh, understand. Uh, it defines uh, in, in a way what, what the funds can be used for, could be used for, may be used for. Uh, in uh, you know in in the future, so uh, it's not pinpointing any particular one. It's not saying it's going to be used for this one. It is a <clears throat> a wide range of possible uses, and I and I think I agree with the mayor that you know when it comes to these funds, I think we're going to uh, we're going to look at where the need is, and and make that decision. Yes, Mr. Aberdeen. Uh, first, Mr. Mayor. In five years, affordable or housing shortage will not gonna go. Uh, I'm not suggesting that. I'm, I'm just using that as an no, example. I'm just Let's say that, 50 uh, years from now, because this doesn't have a sunset clause, right. by the way. Okay. And the next thing I want to ask: What will happen uh, from city attorney? Some of these items, if you delete, what will happen? Just, um, just depending on how it, how it's worded, it may not have an effect. I mean, it just depends at the end of the day what we're talking about. But if it's just we're talking about these essential services and some of them are deleted. I think overall, if they tell the broad picture that it's broad, it's a broad general fund tax, then, then we should be okay. So for example, for example, I'm asking, senior library, if you delete that, what will happen? Nothing, okay. legally nothing. Right. And, and again, I think we, after talking internally among staff and, and with, uh, with our consultant, it was, it, you know, we were trying to get the broadest outreach of, of city services that people might understand what the general fund tax is paying for. And that's, oh. that's why those, those terms are in there. And if it's deleted, then we could, I mean, if it's deleted, then we might lose the senior vote that we might have who sees on here, a sen they're this going to the look course. at something for seniors. I, I will vote for this. Or I'm even more asking important. questions to see where we are going. I'm sorry. I didn't finish my questions. I was just huh? asking questions. Okay. If we would, delete arts and culture, libraries, senior, recreation, parks, police, paramedics, fire. What will happen? Um, pretty nothing, but it'd be pretty narrow if we're just leaving in, for example, affordable housing. And I, you know, legally speaking. Oh, and um, the, on top you say, the measure to expand funding to protect essential services. You leave that on. If you delete some of those items, does that gonna, Legally, impact on this? legally, no, but I, I'm sure your staff will tell you that's probably not advisable. Advisable. Why it's not advisable? Um, if, you, if you only leave in essential services, um, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, Council Member Ajanian, and not describe uh, what those essential services are, and going back to what all of you have said um, throughout your comments uh, on the 12th as well as this evening, um, that broad description and the ability for the general public to understand um, what this tax uh, is meant for 
um, again, on a list of priorities that may come up on an annual basis, that educational piece that needs to be part of the measure will be missed, um, we believe. Um, and so uh, that's the part where, where we think, of course, you have every uh, opportunity to massage the language. Uh, if you feel that it's not um, accurately portrayed in the language, but we would uh, suggest and recommend to you uh, to keep uh, some of the items, if not all of the items, based on those essential services, um, as well as the quality of life kind of indicators that mean different things to different people who go to the ballot box to, to cast a vote. And uh, again, uh, according to the survey that was taken, uh, these services that we're defining are the ones that people felt, the residents felt, were absolutely the most important. So I think if you put those in the ballot measure, you are encouraging people um, to t really take a serious look at it and, and vote for it, I, if they understand it. I thought we are raising the taxes when we are saying specifically this five item or 10 item, not the entire city work. We write here whatever this city is doing. And this was not the purpose. If that's the purpose, why we are having another separate account? So can, let's can uh, collect the taxes and put in general fund, and then city council will decide how it, want, it would like to spend the money. This should be more specific. I mean, I'm not saying to make it one item, but at least to be more specific that what we're going to use this money for. What are the items? Such as affordable housing. Well, okay. I understand that. I mean, and if, if we're if we're gonna call this, we can call this a, an affordable housing tax increase act. And I'll tell you, we'll have streets. difficulty passing it through through the Improve general streets, population. which will people directly will will be affected. Sidewalk. Something like those items. Now I can't say it because I'm upset with this. I can't remember everything specifically to mention here, but this is not what I meant it from the beginning. But how about if there's, let's say, there's a gang problem in the city? In 10 don't years, we want? Yeah. So why we don't, don't specify? We want, let's we wait until next service. we specify gang or whatever, but, and we come to an knows? understanding, and then write it here: gang, affordable housing. I don't know whatever has been written. I'm saying now since I'm upset, I can't remember even what I had in my mind. We're. Okay, so can we go back to the fundamental issue? We have 2% local use tax allowed. One and a quarter has already been taken over by the county and other bodies. All that's left is three quarters of a percent, and that's about to be taken over. There's currently another um, homelessness measure that's being entertained. AQMD is looking at something. They're going to take this over. We're trying to preserve our money for our city's purposes. I agree. Our city's purposes, primarily. Then we decide how that money is going to be used for our city's purposes. Apparently, your definition of city's purposes is very narrow. And I appreciate it. Yours is very narrow. Ours may be a little broader. I'm saying mine is whatever the, uh, the most you know, hot issue is, whatever the, the issue is that requires the most attention most funding. That's my definition. And I realize that 10 years from now, it may be a different issue. And I don't think that it's fair for me to decide today how that money is going to be used in perpetuity for the, last, for the next 200 years. I'm telling you again, this measure does not have a sunset clause. It says, until ended by voters, which means that the voters would have to actually repeal this tax. So, how do I decide in 25 years what that need is going to be in this city? How? How do we come up with an exhaustive list and predict in perpetuity what the needs of the city are going to be? Unless you have a broad definition that allows you to use that money, and then the council that's elected by the residents of the city every year during budget discussions, during budget approval, actually decides on how this money should be used. Point is, first, you can write items you know to perpetuity that you need. 
such as affordable housing. That's not going to go away. I'm all for it. It's there. It's I'm happy. It's already there. I know, but you added too many items there. I didn't add anything. It's I in there, know, and uh, I think a broad definition city, is helpful. Or uh, city attorney pre prepared this. I'm saying some of these items should not be here. I mean, if it's same essentials, if when we say essentials, is only the, again is library, is other stuff, it's fire, it's police and uh, city staff salary, then what's the difference? So we will decide money, let's raise the tax and then later we will decide how we're gonna spend money as we are doing on regular budget matters. But we what we do with our budget? We, we, we bring something, we say this is too much or less or whatever we gave our opinion to change the budget items. So this will go to the same way and then we will decide. This, I would like to see a separate account and will be more specifically defined that where you're gonna use. But, but we're doing exactly that, we're we'll levying the money. Don't limit, don't limit it to affordable housing. But at least we have to know this account which we have separated, where we're gonna use it. If My it's for point. everything that we have on general budget, so then what's the purpose of separating it? So are you okay with doing this and not separating it? Is that what you're saying? So levy the, the way you're doing, what can I say? Well, if that's okay with you, I'll, I'll be fine with it. Because I'm not at the end fine of the with it, but okay. I'm saying this is as if you were doing the same thing. The primary goal, again, uh, the primary goal is to preserve this money for our city and I not agree. allow the county take That's over. That's why I'm, I want and, to work And for secondary, it. when it comes for budget approval, we'll all decide on how to spend it. And we'll be accountable to our residents because they've elected us. That's when the time is to sort of. And, it went, and, and when it comes to. Act as a fiduciary, as Councilmember right. Devine said. Right. But the primary goal is to preserve this money for our city. And we can, during budget approval, argue ad nauseum as to how to spend that money. And it'll be a wonderful argument. You know why? Because the money will be here and we'll be spending it on the city one way or another. But to, to say that because the definition is too broad, I'm gonna give it up to the county, I'm not sure that's the right thing to do. That's why I brought this issue up from the beginning, that I'm against the money to go, because generally I'm against raising taxes on public. That's why I agree. Well, I think any rational human being is against raising taxes on the public. That's, that's the easy part. The difficult part is but to actually say, folks, residents, this is, we abhor doing this, but we're actually saying we should do it. We should raise the, the, the taxes so that the county doesn't and the state doesn't, so we can keep the money here. And then after that, once the money is here, then we can decide on how to spend it. I, I don't understand where the disconnect is. Uh, and just because it's on the ballot, Council member, it doesn't mean that that's what we're going to be spending on. That we're, if it's if the ballot measure passes, it doesn't mean that we're going to go right to paramedics and give them a lot of money. It means that we're going to discuss what the priorities are, and if it's affordable housing, then that's what we're going to spend it on. And that will probably be, I'm going to speak for myself anyway, that will probably be the priority. I don't think you have to be concerned about that. I know the city is how they work. I watched this city for 40 years, reported for 20 years, and I reported from all over the United States. And I know government gets money, and if it's not specifically, at least some frame of where they're gonna use it, I know where the money gonna go. That's what I'm worried about. That's what I want to be specific, and, and where I, we're gonna use this money. And if I may, if I may, um say a couple of things, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, and, and you're the body, um, the executive body that, that makes the policy decisions for this community on a, on a weekly, daily, yearly basis. And you hire me as your city manager um, to, to basically be here and respond to you, and, and um, I've heard you very loud and clear in terms of um, your priorities and needs as of, as of today. However, I will tell you, um, again, based on the way this measure is written, it's written so that a broad perspective of voters out there will have the opportunity to look at this measure 
and vote on this measure based on what they understand um, city services to be. For many, it will be affordable housing, um, and, and they will vote on it because affordable housing is, is part of the language. For others, it may be issues such as safety overall, whether it's fire, whether it's police, um, and again, that falls within the values that uh, your constituents have on, on the things that they feel are necessary or that they need within this community. And so for us to be able to provide that language to them so that they have a broader understanding of what this general tax would be could be utilized for is all we're trying to do in terms of that educational piece so that they will make an educated decision whether they vote for it or not. And ultimately, again, I've heard you loud and clear, and, and, um, and I assure you, it will be separately accounted for. It will come to you through the budget process annually, separately accounted for. It will not, although it's part of the general fund, it will have a separate line item that you will be the decision-making body to tell me, um, and I will tell the department heads in terms of what those priorities are. Um, based on what you know those priorities and needs to be uh, during that time frame uh, for the community. My major concern is in very near future, there will be a recession in this country, and the very first thing, the government goes and taps where they see there is money. And then they will forget everything. We say we are short on budget, so we have to $100 million in this account, let's say, or $60 million and $200 million account, right away, will be transferred to general budget fund and we will pay for the essentials or whatever you call it. That's what I'm worried about. That's what I wanted to have separate account and to be more specific where we're gonna use it for, where we're gonna spend it for. Otherwise, here is two years, three years, it's here, it's coming. Recession definitely will come. A year, later or three years later. M then you have this part yeah. of general budget, so we transfer from here to the other account and we pay for that deficit which we have. Mr. Mayor, if I may, um, just to reassure you, um, just as normal accounting practice, we would absolutely set up a separate account for it. Uh, we had planned on uh, reporting to you, as we do every quarter, what that amount is. It will stay in the general fund until programmed, um, and you will see what that uh, amount is. And in, unless you want to transfer it to a capital project fund to fund a playground, or you want to transfer it to low and moderate income housing fund, we will get the budget authority from you, which we do not have. It's all decided on through the budget process. And that money will move to the low and moderate income housing fund for whatever project you deem appropriate. Other than that, the money will stay in the general fund until you decide what to do with it. So we are not going to take to another account, another well, general to pay for the deficit, which by, by you are estimated pretty soon we're going to have deficit. Not unless the city council tells us to, to do that. Okay. Well, that's not. Let what me we, let me just remind everyone and. Uh, I'm the old guy on the council. Uh, we've been through a recession in Glendale from 2007 to 2010. We've been there. And when that recession hit us, we didn't reach into our reserves and eat our reserves up. We cut over 25% of our workforce. So I don't know how other cities and other counties and other states handle it, but when it comes down to Glendale, this council and many of the staff here bit the bullet and we lowered our employees from 2100 down to about 1500 we didn't just dig into another pot of money which was there we had a what were our reserves 30 million well, much higher now. 40 million 40 sitting 30 there 30 million. we did not dig into those reserves we cut our staff so we've been through it before i don't think this council will do it again that's not what i see in any one of us we've made those tough decisions as far as what happens in the future, it's hard to predict, uh, council member. Next, next year, we may have uh, a problem with our paramedics, that they can't reach the cardiac patients in time. And we have people dying in their homes while our paramedics are trying to reach them. Would that be an appropriate time to say, let's increase our paramedic budget? Maybe it would be. That's a decision we would make. 
As far as seniors, what if the seniors are going hungry and there's not enough meals that we're providing them? Would we say maybe let's increase those senior meals? Maybe. That's something we would make. What if an earthquake hits us and we've got to spend a lot of money on infrastructure, on roads, on our water system, on our other things? Maybe we'll say, okay, that's what we're going to do. It's hard to say in a four-corner box that we're only going to spend it on these items. We have to have some flexibility because the future is uncertain for any of us. And I'll, I'll add something to that as well. In a few years, our um, pension obligations are going to escalate, and they are going to be quite low. <coughs> and okay, so let's say we don't, you know, we, we don't agree to increase these taxes. They go to the county, they go to the state, and five years from now, six years from now, we have to somehow pay monies out of somewhere, and all of a sudden. We don't have these funds. Are we in a better place? I mean, does that put us in a better place? Money, money. so long as we keep the money in Glendale, we can decide on how to spend it. If it's not in Glendale, we're not going to have that luxury. It's that simple. My primary goal is to retain our funds, not to give it up to someone else, so that we can use it as council, the elected uh, officials, those that are elected by the, pop, the, by the populace, by the voters, they, they exercise their best judgment and, and decide what that you know, essential need or use is. Mr. Mayor, I was not against to keep the money here rather than give it to somebody else to spend on something else. Like I, I brought example AQMD or SCAQMD or LA County. I'm not against it. But I want to make sure those who are paying extra taxes will be beneficiary of it in form of directly impacting them. Yeah, I agree and, and I agree and, I, and it's clear to everyone that safety directly benefits all of our residents, that um, essential services direct, directly benefits all of our residents. Again, I understand what your concern is. I, I truly do. You don't want to fall in the trap of the bureaucracy, right. sorry folks, bureaucrats here, there's a lot of you, but you don't want the bureaucracy to be... Take over. Yeah, to be, the, you know, the, 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 to be tempted and say, oh, there's a pot of money, let's spend it. I, I share that. But that's where we come in to exercise our fiduciary obligations, make sure that doesn't happen. But at the end of the day, my primary concern is I don't want the county taking our money. Measure H was the last slap in our face. To take $10 million and give us 280000 back, it's uh, highway robbery, and we're being robbed, in essence. We're being robbed, and I refuse to be robbed. And I want to make sure this money stays in the city. And then we can engage in this conversation during budget discussions and decide how to best spend it. I never assume that any, I have the best interests of our residents uh, more so uh, at heart than any of my colleagues do. And uh, budget discussion is a time when we'll decide to do that. Okay. I said whatever I wanted to say. So the public uh, we'll heard move what we had said. So okay. that's well, all well, I can do. Of course, thank you, and I appreciate it. This is a very healthy discussion. I mean, we, and staff now knows too that all eyes are on you when the time comes. Eight, 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 one, three, four, and six. And six. One. Eight, eight, one, three, four, and six. And then, and then we'll have other items to do on two okay. and five. Okay, can someone second that? I'll second it. I'll second those. May we have the roll call, please? Council members Agajanian? Yes. Devine? Yes. Garpedian? Najarian? Yes. Mayor Sinanian? Yes. Introduction of item 8A2 is the ordinance. It just needs introduction. I'll introduce the ordinance. And item, eight, excuse me, item 8A5 is the motion making appointments uh, to write the ballot arguments for and against. The council can at this time choose to nominate your, or appoint yourselves to write the ballot argument um, if you cho choose to do so at this time. 
Let's pick council member at Garbage. Gar <laughs> <laughs> We have a second. We have a second. Our recommendation is to, to nominate, to, to appoint the council members. <laughs> and Vino. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Go, go, please. Sorry, it was to appoint. To appoint all five council members to write the all argument. In, in oh, is it all five? Yeah. <laughs> all right, it's okay. <laughs> so we have a motion and a second to appoint all five. I took it you were being a jest. Thank you. Thank you. Council member Zagajanian? Yes. Devine? Yes. Garpedian? Najarian? Yes. Mayor Sinanian? Yes. Okay, so I want to I wanna thank my colleagues sincerely for putting the best interests of our residents and putting the best interests of our, of our fiscal health ahead of any populist or, or any political uh, calculations. I think it's uh, those of us that are here today and are voting have, uh, have done the right thing. So I want to thank you once again. Thank you for your votes. And move on to the next item. B is Public Works regarding five-year purchase order contract with Rightway Axle and Suspension Inc. for the provision of specialized miscellaneous parts and labor for city-owned refuse trucks and other heavy-duty vehicles. B1 is the resolution dispensing with competitive bidding related to the execution of a five-year purchase order contract for $450,000. Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, we're going to go to uh, Shay Eccleston Bowers, uh, Senior Public Works Manager, who will give you a, a brief report on this item. Hi, good evening, good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. My name is Shay Eccleston. I'm with the Public Works Department for the City of Glendale. Uh, before you, for your consideration, is a resolution to dispense with competitive bidding and award a five year contract for $450,000 with Rightway Axle and Suspension Incorporated. Um, this particular firm is the only nearby vendor um, qualified to perform as needed axle, suspension, frame, and chassis repairs for city refuse trucks and other heavy duty vehicles. This amount represents an increase in the cost of these services, which is um, directly related to our uh, aging refuse feet, uh, fleet, excuse me. Um, as well as an increased uh, use of contract services due to um, intermittent vacancies that we've had in Fleet Services Division. Um, we believe their prices are fair and staff is uh, satisfied with their work to date. And that's all I have. And they're close by, correct? Yeah, they're in uh, Sun Valley. Okay. I'll move the item. Second. Can we have a roll call, please? Council Member Zagajanian? Yes. Devine? Yes. Garpedian? Najarian? Yes. Mayor Sinanian? Yes. Next item. Mayor and Council, um, just as a matter of housekeeping, again, a reminder that an item 9B under hearings has been moved to a date certain of July 31st. Okay. That leaves 9A uh, before you, which is a public, which is a hearing, and it is public works regarding approval the final engineer's report and ordering <coughs> levy and collection of annual assessments for the North San Fernando Road Corridor Landscape Maintenance District for fiscal year 2018-19. 91 is the resolution approving the engineer's annual levy report. Two is the resolution ordering the levy and collection. Thank you. Mr. Guadagna? Yes, Mr. Mayor, Member City Council. On June 19, 2018, your council adopted resolutions that uh, initiated the proceedings, um, f adopted the preliminary final uh, engineer's report and declared its intention to levy and collect assessment and charges for the uh, North San Fernando Road corridor landscaping and set the public hearing date for today, July 17th. And um, I don't believe we have received any cards. City clerk? Nope. There are no cards. Any questions from my colleagues? I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Second. May we have the roll call, please? Was the hearing open and closed? Hearing is open and closed. Thank Anyone you. wants to speak on it? Council members Agajanian? Yes. Devine? Yes. Garpedian? Najarian? Yes. Mayor Sinanian? Yes. Thank you. And we have oral communications next, is that correct? Yes, it is. Uh, this is a five minute portion. Discussion is limited time, is not part of this agenda. Each speaker is allowed five minutes. Council may question or respond to the speaker, but there'll be no debate or decision. Senior manager may refer the matter to the appropriate department for an investigation and report. Okay. Thank you. We have 
Margaret Dudania. Welcome. Come on. Thank you. Good evening. I just suddenly today decided to come. Uh, I have a question with my neighbors. Uh, okay. Already 38 years, we are the owner that our property neighbor moved 12 years ago. First try, uh, first try, uh, they tried to get our one feet of the way, you know, our property line, but we stopped it through lawyer and survey. Now, they, they, uh, they have a push between property line and their houses. I believe now they want to break down and put new one. But they, when they put new one, when they move little, even five inch, and I believe they want to close also. If somebody, our driver, can go out, you cannot see the back. You know, that way we are going to use our property value. And you know, this, the, even twice when it was a permit division last year and two years ago, because twice we stopped at them. I said, we are going to city, uh, uh, you don't have permit. Even in the permit division, they said, even they have a right close. If they close the uh, let it property line and they have uh, that uh, Porsche, if somebody could go out from them, you cannot see your bag, you know, people moving. I, I don't know. Just I came for advice, what yeah. we have to do. Or can we suddenly, they can just, uh, they, uh, they tear out, or they can start little by little. If they change beams, you know, come more our side, and every time they do something, because we have enough experience with them. I don't know what we have to do, what we can prove, what we have to do. And we are, I'm sorry, almost 15 hours we are guardian. We are, when they are going, what they have to do. Okay, I, okay, thank I mean, you. we'll have staff talk to you. Okay, thank you so much. Perhaps direct you in the right uh, direction. Thank you. So we have, and I'm, I can't read this name. It's, that's it, that's the name. Thank you. Uh, somehow you knew, you knew. So. <laughs> There's a reason I couldn't read the name. Followed by Kharadzian Armine. Honorable Mayor, City Council, Welcome. and City Staff. Thank you for having me. My name is Dion Buckmeyer. I'm a resident of Glendale and I've served in the military. And unfortunately, after serving in the military, I've been dealing with numerous issues. I've used many different medic medications and nothing has seemed to help. One thing that has helped tremendously has been cannabis, but still even after it's fully legal throughout the state of California, after 55% of residents in Glendale, including myself, <laughs> that use cannabis as medication are still not given the right to have a place in the hometown to legally purchase. I demand you honor my needs and honor the voice of the majority in our city. Thank you for your time and I hope you will do the right thing for the military vets like myself. Appreciate it. Uh, Armine Haratian, followed by Jimmy Sala. Ms. Haratian. Your microphone, Mr. Mayor. Armin Kharatian, followed by Jim Nasella. Daniel Brotman is here, followed by Star Irvine. Hi, good evening, Mr. Evening. Mayor, Council Members. Um, my name is Dan Brotman. Tonight, uh, I want to continue talking about the clean energy RFP, but focusing on the total capacity that's being uh, uh, sought after, and specifically the question of planning reserves. Um, the RFP, as you certainly know, is seeking 235 megawatts of capacity. What I will argue is that Glendale doesn't need anything close to this number. Please bear with me while I unpack this because it's a little bit complicated, okay? 
The 235 megawatt number can be broken into two parts. The first is 65 megawatts. That's what's needed just to meet our peak load. I'm sure you remember our peak load is 350 megawatts. That should be a familiar number to you. If we were to shut down Grayson, we'd be short. And 65 megawatts ensures that we can meet that peak load. This comes from GWP and I have no reason to dispute it. It makes sense. The balance is 170 megawatts. That is what are called planning reserves. This is where I have a big disconnect, okay? You have heard a lot about N minus one minus one. Um, GWP will tell you that the 170 megawatts is needed to meet the N minus one minus one requirement. And they will say that this is not really within our control. Um, let me be very clear. There are no FERC requirements whatsoever to maintain N minus one minus one reserve levels. There are no NERC requirements to maintain N minus one minus one levels. And there are no obligations whatsoever under the BASA contract with DWP to maintain N minus one minus one reserve levels. The decision to hold 170 megawatts of reserves or almost 50% above our peak load is solely up to this council. It should be decided on a prudential basis. All talk of external obligations is misleading, full stop. If anyone says otherwise, ask them to show you the actual language <clears throat> in statute or contract. The real question is whether it makes sense to hold such a high level of reserves. Because remember, it doesn't come for free. It's like an insurance contract with steep premiums. How much insurance do we really need? That is the question this council needs to answer. I submit we need no more than what the BASA requires us to have, which is 80 megawatts. Not 170, but 80. We have three options for getting our reserves. One, we can self-supply. Two, we can buy it from someone else. Although I'd say that's probably not a realistic option unless we resolve our transmission issues. Or three, we can get those reserves directly from LADWP. They are actually contractually obligated under the BASA to provide it. Getting it from LADWP probably isn't cheap, and the long-term price under the BASA is, isn't fixed, so it could go much higher in the future if they have to build new capacity to support us. So I see the logic in self-supplying at least some of this 80 megawatts but it is an option that can be quantified, okay? So what happens if we have 80 megawatts of reserves and we have an N minus one minus one event? Here's what you need to know. Under the BASA, LADWP is obligated to cover us, okay? Sure, we'll pay through the nose, but they will cover us. They cannot force rolling blackouts on us unless they themselves are implementing proportionally equivalent level of blackouts on their own service territory. This fact gets lost in all the hyperbole about the lights going out. So what it comes down to is a simple calculus. How often do we think we will have an N minus one minus one event? What's the probability that it will occur when loads are at their historic peak? How long do we expect the event to last? Let's put a range on that. Next, what would we pay LADWP to cover us for those hours or days? And how does that compare to the cost of building generation capacity that will sit idle almost all the time? Let's think about it in this way and do an honest cost-benefit analysis. Let's get away from fear-mongering and uh, fear-mongering about blackouts or misinformation about our contractual or legal obligations. Thank you. Star Irvine, followed by Lori Martin. Star Irvine. Okay. Star Irvine, she's not here. Lori Martin. Can you can you please not speak from? If are you, is are you Lori Martin? Oh, star, so it's your turn. I, that's why I kept calling Star Irvine. Star Irvine. Okay. Hi. Hello. You guys are working hard. It was very interesting and very uh, thoughtful, your work this evening.
I'm with the Rancho people trying to stop the rezoning. And I'm trying to be happy and put some positive at the end of an evening for y'all. I brought Portos. <laughs> I heard you like it. Who doesn't? <laughs> and um, I don't know if you got to the Rancho, but I put a bumper sticker here that has the website to go to if you want to get, learn some stuff about what's going on. And that's all. And I thank you for your time. Okay. And uh, you guys working hard. It's very uh, impressive, very impressive. Uh, I don't know, I got five boxes. And there's little happy face cookies. So hopefully that'll put a happy face on you. Are you trying to buy us off? Yeah, you, you, off this? I mean, you know that's illegal, <laughs> right? The ranch was very sweet and wonderful. And then I brought some sweet and wonderful. Is that legal? <laughs> Is that legal, city manager? Yep. Thank you much. <laughs> put this in the public place. We'll take it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I know it's a little late for sweets, but I think you guys need a pickup. All right. Okay. Take care. Thank you, Ms. Irvine. Yeah. Well, thank wow. You. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Well. Irvine. Okay, that was the last speaking card. I want to thank everyone for coming tonight <laughs> and ask for my colleagues. Uh, we have no new business, do we? Yes, okay, do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. And we're adjourned at 8.30 p.m.